Oh, do I start? All I right. All right, let's get started then. <laughs> so I'm going to argue for bringing back ICOs. But before I get started, I just want to say neither of us are lawyers. We're not going to talk about the regulatory side of things, really. We're going to talk about market structure. Uh, I'm not commenting on any sort of regulatory anything. So uh, just want to be clear on that. So my argument for bringing back ICOs is that the current token launch structure is deeply flawed. Uh, right now, instead of democratizing access and putting market participants onto an equal playing field, what we actually have is a structure that leads to low float, high FTV tokens that are unfair to some market participants. Look, fundamentally, I believe that the best way to build a community in crypto is to make a lot of people some money, not make a few people all of the money. So I think reforming how we do token launches is the best way to accomplish that. People like to win together. People want to win with their team. Some, something that a lot of teams do right now is they'll do an airdrop of tokens. But airdrops are a really awful solution because they're capital inefficient. You're just giving away those tokens. And they actually incentivize airdrop farmers to civil attack your protocol. And you lie to yourself, and you uh, are basically fooling yourself into thinking you have more traction than you actually do. So these airdrops, it's just a terrible meta. You're giving away the money, and uh, you're lying to yourself about your metrics. So what's more fair? What should we actually be doing? I think we should give people the ability to buy tokens and have true price discovery as quickly as possible. Market distortions, like low floats, destroy value. Maybe investors or founders feel good by looking at their balance sheet and they say, like, oh man, I'm so rich. But they're lying to themselves too, because the number on the screen is not a real number when your float is 2%. It's just not real. You need enough float for true price discovery. And what I would like to see is an exploration of the design space of ICOs. It's not just a simple auction, but you can do creative things, like uh, allow people to bid with different lockups. You get a lower price with a longer lockup. You can have lockups that are based on KPIs instead of being based on time. Or you can even look at how a bidder has participated in past ICOs and what they did afterwards, and then use that to judge you know, what kind of deal they get in the current ICO. So overall, you know, uh, I think my opponent is going to talk about how ICOs can be scammy, and yes, ICOs have been scammy before, uh, but I think uh, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and anything can be scammy. We should explore the design space for more efficient capital formation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how scammy ICOs are. In fact, what I'm going to talk about is the two most iconic projects in the history of crypto. One is Ethereum, that's an ICO, and the other one is Solana, that is the VC coin. And guess which one is doing better? Solana, the VC coin is doing better. <laughs> that's it. That's my argument. <laughs> but to elaborate more, uh, uh, what, uh, what VCs do bring, uh, uh, so first of all, uh, VC investment and ICOs can coexist. But uh, let's assume they're fully, uh, there's a full dichotomy between the two. What VCs bring to the table is uh, some of the best ones, including Multicoin, can actually um, add a lot of value to, um, to the project itself. So to give an example, Solana is actually a really good example, right? I think you guys made a huge impact in the early days of Solana. Obviously not discrediting, not discrediting the Solana team themselves, but you guys, for example, connected the Solana team with the most important players in the early days, notably FTX, but that's another story. But FTX, for better or worse, was a, an important player in the early days of, of, um, of Solana, and you guys uh, made that happen. Um, and uh, I think that's just the key difference between having a VC on board and having a bunch of retail participating in, in an ICO. So, 
Let's start with the basics, because that's what I like to do. Uh, Tushar, what is an ICO? What is an ICO? Uh, I think an ICO is a offering of tokens to the public. And I think what differentiates an ICO from, from an IPO is uh, its permissionless access. I think permissionless access is the, the key differentiator that uh, you know, is aligned between an IPO structured equity process where only big hedge funds get to participate. And if you're retail, you only get to buy after it lists. And usually there's a pop. And ICOs allow regular people to go and participate at the same terms as the big sophisticated investors. If you're, if you're pro ICO, I've heard quite a bit of people saying, oh man, the ICOs were so much better right, than what we have today. But if they made so much sense, why have we evolved so far away from them? Oh, regulatory uncertainty and uh, a regulator that decides to regulate by enforcement rather than guidance. Uh, I think it's without that regulatory hindrance, I think we would have ICOs. Kiao? Yes. Given how much the industry has changed over the last six years, even if we have regulatory guidance that you're talking about, Tushar, And given the incentive that the different actors have in the space, is it even possible to bring back ICOs? I mean, ICOs exist today, right? Like, ICOs are taking our, you know, there's ICOs going on all the time offshore outside of the US. If we're talking about in, inside the US, I think there is, like, do we consider coin, the, like the coin list uh, token yeah. sale as ICO? I, I think we can, and those are regulated, effectively regulated ICOs. So, it's already happening today. What does a typical successful ICO look like? Typical su success what? ICO look like. Um, well. Because we've so, had so many, I mean, people yeah. who are very uh, suspicious about the space and there is so, so much money that's been lost, right? Yeah. So what's the right way to do an ICO? The right way to do an ICO. I think you want to at least try to replicate the, uh, you know, how, TradFi does it not in the actual process, but in, in spirit, meaning specifically transparency. I think you want to disclose as much as possible about the team, what you want to do, uh, what you want to build, where you are based, what are some of the, uh, ideally, what is the vesting schedule of ICOs. I think that's one of the key differences between ICOs and, and VC investing. Uh, I think you want to have a, a good ICO is, some, uh, is one that has a, a long vesting, long lockup, so that the team is more incentivized to, to be in it for, long, for, for the long term. Um, so transparency, I think, is probably the most important. So you're saying you're vesting that's long enough for the team to be incentivized, right? Yeah. And ultimately, like, like look, it, the, we don't, I don't think we necessarily need regulations to enforce transparency, but the market will, should, in theory, take care of this, right? Like, in, over the long term, the ICOs that don't provide the transparency should be um, discredited by, by the market, right? So hopefully the market will take, take care of it. Yeah, actually, if I can answer, you know, with an example of what I thought was, I don't know if I want to call it an ICO or not, but a very well done offering of tokens. And this was recent, not a multi-coin portfolio company, but a builder here who I have a lot of respect for, uh, was the Sanctum team who did a offering. And it was very well thought out with different structures, you know, the longer lockup you took, the better price you got. Uh, they had a, a number of anti-bot mechanisms in there. I thought it was one of the more thoughtful offerings out there, so I, I just want to shout them out as a success case, in my opinion. I feel like there is, in this space, more and more conversation about that, obviously. And more and more founders were saying, oh yeah, man, what's happening with these uh, low float high, DV, high FDV tokens is not good. But I also feel like a lot of founders are still incentivized to do those, right? So no, not go the ICO way. How do we change their mind? Oh, public markets have to change their mind, right? It needs to be public markets need to reward people who launch tokens with a high float and 
not reward people who have this low float, high FTV game. And that's my honest view. Like, that's not even me taking a debate stance. Like, stop supporting people who do the low float, high FTV game. That's not what is healthy for capital markets. That is not what leads to the best capital formation. And that's not what leads to good price discovery. So you need to have enough float out there to see what the price really should be. And any market distortions are net negative. So what happens to the project that raised a lot of money at a high valuation that might still kind of be in this game of I mean, kind of the previous game, right? But the market is slowly but surely changing. How do they deal with that? How do the projects yeah. deal with if you raise at a high valuation and you raise yeah. a lot of money, yeah. how do you deal with that now? Um, I, I don't really have any advice for them. My advice for our founders, the, the startups that we invest in, in is to raise um, just enough money. That don't, that don't get greedy with the, the money you can raise with the valuation, because more money will actually kill you. Uh, more money means more distraction. It means you're constantly thinking about hiring. You're constantly building a huge team. You're going to create a lot of bureaucracy within the team. When you pivot, you're going to, it's going to be very hard to align the whole team. right? So having too much money is actually very counterproductive. So I advise all our startups to do the, the, the very opposite of, of what you, uh, the phenomenon you described. I know we're supposed to disagree, but uh, I, I said the same thing. Look, VCs like us will, uh, and, and our peers will try and give you more money because that is our business model. But the best uh, teams stay hungry. You know, look at how much Solana raised in venture rounds compared to how much some of their peers, the other L1s, raised. And I actually think they did better because they had less money, because they were forced to stay lean, they were forced to ship, they were forced to stay hungry, and they didn't have all this bloat. Yesterday, we talked about uh, the fact that we were kind of a bit down because of these you know, uh, sideways markets and not a lot of deal flow because you have to justify your existence as a, as a VC, right? If we're moving more and more towards the ICOs again, how do you guys play this game? We would participate. It would just be on an equal playing field with everyone else. Right now, you know, honestly, we get preferential access because we can help people, we have a brand, uh, and that's valuable, and I love it, and you know, thank you. Uh, but uh, you know, we have to play the game that's on the field. We don't get to choose what the game is, we, so we would play with the new rules. Maybe a last question about, because um, I've seen some, some founders just really be really scared about these big unlocks, right, right at the beginning. And, I mean, obviously, Solana is not an ICO, but you had an experience of a big unlock that was kind of scary for you. Do you want to explain us how you felt and what really happened? And maybe this can help some founders think a different way about these big unlocks. Yeah. Uh, I think people have a fundamental misalignment between what venture investors think and what public markets think. On the venture side, we think, uh, a lot of us, that long lockups are good because they align incentives. Because it means that we're demonstrating to you that we're in it for the long term. But there's a double-edged sword here. There's another side, which is the long lockups mean that there is a low float, which leads to a high FTV, which means that the people who are buying on the public markets get a bad deal. Because there just isn't enough ownership to go around in the public market. So, what public market investors want to see is they want to see high float. They want to see true price discovery without market distortions that let them actually see what is this thing worth, not uh, you know, some made up number that's, that's on the screen. So I, I think we have to fix this uh, mismatch. And doing you know, a big single token unlock is one way to do that. It's not the only way to do that. That's what Solana did. And you know, I don't know if any of you remember what the timeline was like heading into that big Solana unlock in January of 2021. I certainly do. It was everyone and their mom talking about how, oh my god, everyone's going to dump everything. There's this big unlock. Uh, but 
you, you know what I think really worked there is it allowed for real price discovery. Everyone who wanted to sell could sell, and everyone who wanted to buy could buy, and we got to see what is the thing actually worth. And it wasn't some made up number that was manipulated by exchanges and market makers to try and make someone feel good. It's time for the closing thoughts on both sides. <laughs> who should go first? You know, actually, I, you know, I'm actually on two charts side, uh, but I have to steal man the other side. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I think we should bring back ICLs. <laughs> uh, well, that's going to be hard to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> I had a whole thing about, you know, look, I think a great launch should be liquid. That's what matters. That, like, that's what public markets are about. They're about liquidity and they're about price discovery. Uh, and the baseline that you're looking for is really find out what is this thing worth. Everyone who wants to buy should be able to buy. Everyone who wants to sell should be able to sell. And let's let markets figure out what the value is rather than trying to decide with a small group of people how much things should be worth. You know, this is the root of capitalism. I also think a great launch should be fair. I think it's important to give people equal access. Uh, I think that's why we're here. That's why this industry exists, is to democratize access. And uh, I think token launches are one of the big wealth creation events that we should democratize access for. So look, the status quo just doesn't lead to that. And I hope we see the regulatory clarity and the change That'll lead to the exploration of the design space for ICOs. Uh, and I think we can do so much better than IPOs do, where IPOs are just you know, a bank going to a handful of big hedge funds who set the price, and they're automatically in the money on day one. I think we can uh, you know, explore interesting structures and allow markets to play a role here. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is the, the most successful project or asset in the last, I don't know how many decades, uh, in terms of return, is in fact Ethereum, right? 2014 ICO, they raised $18 million, and then over the subsequent decade, uh, Ethereum did a 10,000x, and everyone on the planet could um, have access to Ethereum and buy into the ICO. So I, for sure, I think, uh, on balance, ICOs um, is, is better is a net positive. Now, we need proper disclosures, of course, right? Like, I think that's a critical thing. And uh, I don't want to say that all ICOs have been good. There have been some really scammy ones. They make promises. And you know, it, I think you need proper disclosures. You need to understand who is involved. Uh, and I think that comes down to the market. The market should, like Chow was saying, the market should demand these disclosures and don't participate if you don't have that full information. Do you guys want to guess uh, which ICO in 2017 actually built a good product? <laughs> a product uh, that works that people love. That's a good argument against, actually. <laughs> it is. It's, that's, that's the argument against. You can't think of anyone, right? Can you think of one? Did I just hear yeah. something in the Did audience? I hear name? Chainlink? Chainlink did the ICO in 2017? Xerox is one, yes. BNB is another one. Mm. Um, and there is probably only a handful. The vast majority did die, although the investors did well. What's that? Tron. Tron. Yes. <laughs> Ave. Ave was 2017? Ethland, that's right. So there's probably one, only a handful that, that did really well, that built a really good product. The vast majority died, so that's ultimately the argument against it, and the empirical evidence against it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. You know, appreciate it. And thank you, Chow, for being a good sport and taking the harder side of the debate. So. Thank you, Tushar. <laughs> thank you.